do you think competences and degrees uh, are enough to tackle these new challenges? How can we make progress? Well, thank you for inviting me, first and foremost. I'm really happy uh, to uh, uh, take part in this panel discussion. I indeed represent French universities and French universities uh, uh, today, of course, uh, uh, are fully integrated in, the, uh, uh, on, in a European ecosystem. Um, which takes on more and more meaning. Unfortunately, a few months ago, I don't know if you saw the guidelines that EUA, uh, the uh, European um, uh, University Association, um, uh, put forward in line with some fundamental values that unfortunately are called into question. Uh, it is very difficult uh, nowadays to discuss higher education research and education without, of course, mentioning what's happening in Europe. And the objectives uh, of uh, uh, universities uh, uh, have to do with uh, democratic values, opening up to the rest of the world, all to social and societal challenges in the broadest sense of the term. French universities, since you ask, same as other European universities and all European universities are uh, going through a transformation. I'm not sure about the concept of that continuum uh, between um, training, research, innovation, and uh, uh, employment uh, uh, job opportunities, but there is that connection between uh, training and uh, research. So tr training uh, fu fully integrated with research, yes, that is the very essence of uh, uh, a PhD. It also is at the core of master's degrees. And this is what generates a, uh, an ecosystem that is conducive to innovation and generates talents that are important for uh, uh, the entry on the labor market. Of course, uh, there are major research universities that have gained in visibility and they've differentiated themselves from small universities by being really rooted in a region, in a co local community. The role that a university plays in its local area is absolutely essential. Uh, how can we engineer a uh, convergence between higher education, research, generate innovation together with that ecosystem opening up to uh, the rest of the world and to europe all of these strong points are brought to the fore and i think french universities have really seized on that opportunity um, and there's a french initiative uh, to open together with european universities and uh, um, university alliances uh, uh, it, it, initiatives and opportunities that we could not have anticipated on, and that came as a nice surprise. Yes, to rise to all these challenges. Can we rise to these challenges uh, outside of a European association, not only when it comes to science, but also when it comes to um, uh, main social challenges, uh, uh, digitization, uh, sustainable development, uh, etc. Well, we'll come back to that indispensable uh, European cooperation uh, and competition on uh, the in, uh, in the international arena. Can we come back to you, Anna Panagopoulou or Maria Leptin? Uh, I'm asking for. Uh, technicians to uh, tell me because we'd really like to hear you. I'm here. I'm fine. I'm here as, as well. Now I hope it's fine as well. You're here too. Okay. Welcome to both of you. Uh, well, I come back to my first question. And could you hear Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Tunon de Lara just now? Okay. Uh, we could extend with you like uh, what I was calling an overview, maybe about the aims at uh, the commission about that. Can we start with this? Yes. Thank you. Thanks so very sorry much. for before. Thank you very much for the no invitation. Problem. I'm happy, happy to, see you. to be with you today. So I hope this time 
the connection will be stable. Uh, first of all, um, I think that we 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 have all of us to 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 remind uh, the latest political developments from the Commission side. We started with a very strong uh, policy agenda and communication on the establishment of the new European research area. A European research area with uh, a pact for values for research and innovation that will be valid for 10 years and the strong policy agenda for a period 22-24. In all these political documents, universities play an important role. The, the role of universities for research, the role of universities in the international states, the role of universities in the innovation ecosystem, a lot of universities as actors to deliver impact for the society. In parallel, in January 2022, a new strategy for universities has been adopted by the European Commission with flagship initiatives and also where it is highlighted very much the role of universities in the international uh, stage, but also what universities could do more to be actors that they deliver knowledge and concrete results for the society. So what I would like to, to highlight in four key messages, what we expect, what are the challenges and the opportunities that we can have in the years to come for European universities. First of all, under the current circumstances, even more, universities play a vital role in science diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And they can help building bridges and uh, to promote the fundamental values and principles on how we can implement research innovation and how the system should be established. We're talking about academic freedom, we're talking about institutional autonomy, open education and open science at their core. Our guiding principle, and it was said before, is as open as possible, as close as necessary. That we, it should be followed in research and innovation result, uh, uh, relations also with global partners. The second one is how and what will be the role that the universities could play in the world's post pandemic recovery and how we will be able to save our resilient societies and economies. So we do need to have a new role for universities and the strategy for universities uh, presented concrete actions on and how the universities could be the enabler for that. And we have to support the universities in the years to come. And that's why we have this new strategy in place. The third point, and it was said also at the introductory speeches, is what we can do more to attract talents in Europe. This is very important. Our universities need to attract talents, to retain talent but also to create a flexible and attractive academic careers, but even more to reform the, assess the research uh, uh, assessment uh, system in such a way that uh, the universities and the researchers and the research organization could respond to the new needs. So this is the assessment reform is a global effort. We cannot do it in an isolation and universities are actors that they will be able to deliver that. And finally, I would like to say that European universities need to remain competitive in the world scene. And this is a reality after Brexit. This is a reality in the competitive environment that we have today. And I believe, and we believe in the European Commission, by changing the mentality around uh, the researchers and the research assessment, but also promoting new opportunities for careers for the actors in the universities, we will be able to deliver what we want, a global leadership and our universities to excel across the world. Yes. Do you think, um, Anna Panafogolou, do you think uh, that we really need to think more in terms of competition? Is that a problem in, in European countries versus Asia or North America? or we don't have to be obsessed by that in a certain no, way. I think, I think, of course, we have to think how we are positioned ourselves. In the yes. But on the other side, what we have to think, how we can become even more excellent from what we are now. So competition is one thing. And of course, we have always to compare ourselves. But what it matters even more is to ensure a strong collaboration between universities at European level and the member states in order to increase our competitiveness and our excellence. So I think this is what we have to start. And of course, then 
in a, in a, in a global uh, assessment system, we have to be able to compete ourselves with others. Yeah, we, we lost to Chad Basarudin, who is, uh, I said, uh, well, far away from us now, uh, what he thinks about European uh, conduction. But uh, at first, I would like to, to put that question to Maria Leptin. Can you hear me, Maria Leptin, too? And could you hear what's it uh, now, of course? Yes, welcome to you. Um, about this, this fine, I'm not sure the connection is excellent. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It breaks, but go ahead. Okay, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, about this strength and uh, of the research funding system in uh, in Europe, and we were talking about competition with Anna Panabogulu. Um, what would you think about the competition on international level, the competitive level? Is it absolutely necessary, or do we have to go our own way? Well, so there's two things about that. Um, if I speak about research rather than education, um, in re research is in its nature competitive. If you do research, you want to discover something that other people don't know yet. Otherwise, it's not research. So, and you want to be first because, um, you know, like I say, otherwise you won't discover anything. So research in a way in its nature is competitive. And of course we must do everything to make our researchers in Europe competitive. So we must give them a good environment in which they do their work. We much must fund them. Um, we must give them the freedom to do whatever they want, whether it's moving around or saying what they think um, or whatever. So yes, research in its nature is competitive and therefore we must allow our researchers to compete. But research is also collaborative and de it depends on interactions with each other. And that, of course, cannot be restricted to Europe. So uh, we need to collaborate with researchers in other countries. And um, in order to be successful, we have to also, we have to both compete globally and interact globally. So I think um, it's not a competition which only one person can win or only one country can win, but we have to be at the forefront of research um, in order for that research to make sense. Yeah. What would be our weaknesses? Let's talk about this. Um, could be the lack of unity, maybe the lack of shared ideas, what we are working on today. Again, it's, yes, it's would a yin say, Would you say it? It, it, it's there are two sides to the coin. Um, I believe in diversity and not only in diversity in individuals that we must listen to everybody's views and include everybody's talents. I also believe there are different ways of doing things and it's good. Uh, and and, and uh, Anna mentioned resilience, I mean, you mentioned resilience. You know, having different ways of doing things allows one to explore. Um, but of course, as we've heard, the uh, lack of comparability of career structures in some of our countries and the, uh, the inability to transit easily from one country to another because of pension schemes, because of degrees not being recognized, that's not good. There we need to unify. But otherwise, I think having different styles of universities, different styles of research institutes is, is a benefit, it's a bonus. Mm -hmm. So the diversity in Europe is good, but uh, where it inhibits mobility, um, we have to counteract it. Researchers have to move, have to move more, but maybe they are, I would say the, the word I don't know, maybe they are scared to leave their country, not be able to come back. It's not that easy to go from one place to another. Maybe I can ask this question to Manuel Tenondalarato. Maria Leptin, what do you think about it? Well, I think once again, you know, if you're scared, you're not going to be a good researcher. Uh, you have to be <laughs> great and bold. And actually, it's, it, I find this wonderful in Europe that most people are happy to move. And we have many programs, you know, we have the program for programs for young students, Erasmus, um, etc. We have Marie Curie, we have many programs that encourage movement. And I think it, it benefits everyone. You, you, you see it, you know, it, at universities, as professors, as heads of research lab, you see that it enriches young people to explore um, 
uh, sorry, Europe and the world. So I, I do think uh, encouraging young people to move is very important. Sticking in one country, uh, it, it you know narrows the mind. Even if the research and education in that country is excellent, the learning different cultures. That's one of you know that's a wealth we in Europe have that we have these many different research cultures and many different culture cultures. So I, I'm a strong believer in mobility. If I hear you well, the best countries would be those who accept strangers, but they have to accept foreign languages too. <laughs> yes, indeed. And we see that very clearly, for example, in the, in, in, uh, the ERC grants are distributed unevenly throughout Europe. And uh, it is, perhaps a coincidence, but I don't believe it's a coincidence that the most grants go to countries that really welcome foreigners. Mm -hmm. uh, this includes, for example, England and Switzerland. And not only that, not only do the uh, research grants go to those countries that ex uh, accept foreigners, also look who in the country is most likely to get a grant. It's the foreign researchers. So the, the, the foreign researchers in those countries are strongly overrepresented in the successful applicants. So again, this says mobility, but it also says welcoming, a country welcoming strangers and foreigners coming in is good for their research culture. Yeah. So I think that is the best proof that it's not just a feeling, but it's evidence that internationality helps. Okay. Um, I would like Manuel to ask Manuel Tunon de Lara what he thinks of this mobility of the need to welcome foreign researchers that uh, Maria was focusing on. Uh, she referred to England, you know, the United Kingdom, but she didn't mention France, for example. So why is that, uh, Manuel? Yes, I agree with Maria Lepton's analysis. I believe that spontaneously there is a need for mobility, international cooperation, uh, research, of course, a, a researcher will go towards teams in other countries. It's very important for policy, as we've said, for national policy to be a welcoming policy. And there's a dimension that we haven't mentioned, which is the financial dimension. The financial dimension welcome the infrastructures we have so we have to ask ourselves questions you know we're talking about competition with asia or the united states what is the level of financing of research higher education in europe in our countries how in france do we create the conditions to allow that uh, welcome and hosting of foreign researchers. And that strikes me as essential in mobility. A researcher will go to a place that will make his life easier and facilitate his research, which will satisfy their curiosity that Maria Lepton was talking about. That is the driving force. And, and that is what will push a researcher to go to another country. So now let's go to Asia now. Jan Bazarudin, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, Domi, yeah, sorry. You are. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you properly. Thank okay, you. Okay, that's that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. You could hear all what we have been saying so far? Yes. Okay, can I ask you, how do you see this development in Europe? We are talking now about mobility, about also about uh, financement. But um, do you have an example we can follow from the from the, the standards here in Europe? Of course, there is a Bologna process, but maybe... Okay, uh, thank you, you Dominic. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting Inquire, you know, to be one of the um, interventional speakers here. Um, well, from outside, we, we, uh, we see that European, you know, is uh, a good example of an uh, uh, ecosystem. I think Manuel already mentioned about a good ecosystem earlier. Um, you, you have, I think, all the components. Um, you have the Bologna process, which create the uh, uh, European higher education area. And then you have the European standard and guidelines, uh, which then uh, establish a car, you know, to see whether such guidelines are being practiced or not. In addition to that, of course, 
uh, you have, uh, I, I call it a three pillars which support the development of uh, education, research and innovation uh, in, uh, in harmony. Uh, the, the first element, of course, the European University Association, which uh, I think they are very strong in supporting that. And then also you have uh, student engagement. I think it's incomparable. I mean, Europe, uh, you, in your area, student engagement is really, uh, you, you know, something that uh, uh, I think we can use as a good example. And then the, the third pillar, of course, you have in and QA, which connecting all the uh, quality assurance agencies uh, within uh, Europe, you know. Well, I agree to uh, with all the previous speakers that higher education is a global and, you know, it's borderless uh, issues and uh, subjects. So we can no longer, you know, develop higher education in isolation we, within our own uh, region uh, or countries, you know. So uh, we have taken into account all the uh, global asset, global resources, and also you, you mentioned what the mobility will be uh, one of the uh, mm -hmm. critical issues. I think that's my response so far, Dominic. Okay, um, Chan Pasarudin, another question, maybe more precise. Well, from where you stand, um, Asia actually, but from your international um, network for quality assurance and agencies mm -hmm. in uh, higher education. From where you stand, what is statement on international good practices that may stimulate Europe? I'm I'm putting it on the reverse side. Uh, from where you are, what would you say about a good reason to stimulate our practices? Uh, okay. Um, uh, first, of course. Uh, I, I don't think there is such a short statement that will uh, in, encapsulate all <laughs> the, the matters. But uh, uh, I, I mentioned that the uh, high education research innovation is uh, is global issue. Uh, then diversity, inclusions, and mobility will be uh, one of the uh, I mean uh, attributes of a good practice that. Uh, uh, every country should observe, uh, and also the, the changing, you know, of the, the trend of education and technology. Where I think a previous uh, Maria, I think, mentioned about the uh, 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 um, uh, micro credentials, you know, that that sort of new things where uh, people can digitally uh, prove and verify their credential you know, using the latest technology. I think uh, such um, area will be the, the development for the, uh, for the future and already happening now, actually. Yeah, thank you for the answer. I would just signal it in French. I would just like to come back to French because the question is asked in French. Uh, for all four of you, and of course, we can talk about this in the room. We have a first question, which I believe is quite interesting and comes back to what you said, uh, Manuel Tunon de Lara in particular. You know, is there maybe a risk that competition among higher education and research institutions, which is implemented in the name of excellence, but won't there be too much competition between researchers in the same institution? Is this a risk perhaps you identify? you know, cooperation among researchers, but quality of research might, you know, won't there be a problem if there's too much competition among researchers? And there's an issue as well of, of financing and funding given to institutions that are recognized as excellent. And won't that favor higher education institutions in large cities, as opposed to smaller education institutions? So this is perhaps something as well that Chan Bazarudin can perhaps comment afterwards. Uh, Anna, upon a, uh, that comment coming from online. Is there? Is there? Can you hear me, Anna? Yes, and we can't hear you. Again, is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I hear you very yes, well. okay. Okay. Did you hear the question? Uh, it's about competition and uh, whether yes. No. Yes, it's about competition inside inside the same. Uh, same university, for instance, is there a risk, you know, to to put competition too much on the um, online, and so so the, this might be difficult for for the 
the higher education itself? Is there a risk? Well, I mean, we inside the, I, I don't also have- Also with the smallest one. Yes, yes excuse I, me. It is, uh, I don't have an experience personally on competing inside the same institution. Huh? Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is that and based on what Maria Letin said as well, um, the, the, the research is excellent. It's about excellent, it's about competition because without competition, we'll not be able to have the best results and to, to compete uh, in, the, in the international sphere and to deliver the new technologies that we expect. Nevertheless, what we we'll try to do in the European Commission uh, when we are funding through our research and innovation program, apart from ensuring that uh, the results and the evaluation uh, is done in the, according to the excellence criteria, we also try to put measures that they are going, first of all, to uh, uh, support uh, those uh, organizations, institutions that they are lacking behind and they don't have the same opportunities to receive the funding to improve themselves. We are trying also um, uh, to create more, there is a need also to create collaboration and cooperation internally in the organization in, also to, in order to create a critical mass of the institution itself and to be able to be more excellent and to be able to compete yeah. better in the in the our funding uh, opportunities and last but not least what i would like to say and i think it brings very much to what we discussed be before about the mobility of the researchers what we'll try to do in the commission and i think that's valid for its member state and at european level as well and the organization is to create a new european framework for research careers which enable the researchers not only to have a better chances of mobility and careers but also to, to recognize their work and to help them also to have more chances themselves as researchers to compete at the international stage, to sure. finance their research and to implement their research. Sure, thank you, Anna Pandapogulu. Oui, Manuel, bon, sur, sur cette question, 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 moi, je crois que le, le risque... Well, on this question, I believe that the risk within institutions, you know, uh, the structuring of research is teamwork, really. Of course, it depends on how institutions are run. But, you know, uh, it's not a good strategy to, you know, have too much competition, of course, in an establishment, it's teamwork. But there are forms of competition, two forms. You know, there is scientific competition, which is healthy competition, which is natural competition. And if you want to go a step further in research, you have to organize that healthy and stimulating competition. And then there's competition for funding. And of course, the issue is the, the share of funding on projects versus uh, fundamental financing. So a lot of researchers need to have visibility in the longer term. They need to have an environment which allows them to do their research. Of course, we can have bad competition when financing or funding on projects is too important or, or you know, occupies too much space compared to the fundamental, the basic funding that researchers need to ensure survival of their research. And the issue is a bit further is even the funding given to excellent institutions compared to smaller institutions. So among different institutions, and maybe I could ask Maria the same question. Yes, well, there is a risk, of course, but I think it's our responsibility to find the right path. I am in favor of the concept of distributed excellence. Uh, I, it was discussed with our German friends. Uh, it was, we, we, tr we tried to focus on these issues together today in France at any rate. There are niches of excellence with small universities sometimes in an ecosystem that succeeds very well, that attracts talent. And you can see these small universities in European alliances based on specific themes. And of course, it's difficult to compare them with multidisciplinary large universities that have like a consortium of multidisciplinary research. I believe we shouldn't have people competing at the same level. I think we need to respect the path of each institution. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Lepton, on this point. Uh, a, a double question that was asked. What would you have to say about that? Well, uh, you know, it's, um, 
I think the leaders, a leader of a university must make sure that his university or her university works as a team. It is really important. We're stronger as a team than if we um, uh, compete with each other all the time. But we do compete. We compete for the best students. So there's no point in, you want the best students in your team. And if your neighbor also wants the best students, you're competing by definition. But we also encourage competition. We award prizes. Um, sometimes to entire universities, for instance, I'm thinking of the English Athena Swan uh, Prize, which goes to universities that do um, give the, that, that enable women uh, and, and support women. So that's a competition. We, we all the time, we encourage competition to achieve excellence. And the students, you know, they want the best grades. So also competition. So it's so deeply ingrained in, 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 in uh, research and education, this competition, that we, we can't make it go away and it, it wouldn't work. But of course, competition should not be out of greed or out of, uh, you know, it shouldn't be the primary aim to compete. It is always to achieve something good. And um, sometimes that works better with collaboration and with uh, by working in teams, but sometimes it works best by a lone effort. But as I said, uh, leaders of universities have to make sure that everybody flour flourishes in their university and um, enable everyone to, to be as good as they can. Okay, uh, Chan Basarudin, would you like to say something uh, also about this, um, this risk of uh, going more on excellency and maybe not supporting enough smaller university or institutions? Okay, first, I think I'm totally in agreement with the previous speakers that uh, competition is actually the one that uh, keep you moving forward. You know, uh, mm -hmm. If you are to achieve excellence, then uh, competition is uh, one way of doing that. But of course, uh, in, in, you know, uh, in idealized, I mean, far from ideal world, uh, we have to recognize that some uh, universities are, you know, struggling, you know, start from the beginning. So in, in case of diverse, uh, 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 diverse uh, level of quality, then there has to be a level of intervention for supporting the weak. And of course, uh, at the same time, encouraging the, the strong to, to move forward, you know. So uh, there has to be different um, uh, policy and also type of intervention. Funding, for example, uh, competitive funding is uh, very common uh, for, for supporting research. But of course, uh, there has to be also allocation for, for those who are weak to start uh, from the earlier stage. Thank you. Yeah, um, I would like to have another point uh, with your discussion now. Uh, Talking about, I'm coming back to employability, you said, uh, Manuel Luno de Lara, maybe that was not the first thing to think about, but this is really important today. Um, I mean, how can the, the EU generate what we call in France, the licorne? I would like to know the terms in English. Do you have something like licorne? Uh, you know what they are here. <laughs> And um, of course, that's these very successful, successful startups, um, as of course they have also in Asia or North America. How can uh, the EU generate what we call this very excellent startups? What is eventually missing to reinforce employability capacity to create them? And also I'm talking about small or medium sized enterprises, of course, not only smallest one. What would you say about that, all of you? Who wants to, who wants to react to that question, which is part of our discussion, this first uh, discussion? Maybe Maria or Anna first, or I don't, I don't really uh, have anything to say on that, except that it does seem to be uh, unit. By the way, is the English word. Um, uh, it it does from what I hear the um, venture capital is becoming more interested in funding startups and um, in Europe. So, and people are staying in Europe, you know, the, the um, 
the big AI company DeepMind. That's in Europe, that's not in Silicon Valley. Um, so I think I think we are seeing more um, more boldness and more ability to 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 go for risk in Europe already. And may it continue. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Manuel Tenant de Lara, puis peut-être Anna aussi. Alors, moi, je crois que. Je, je, je What I think uh, is, well, it is on the natural that uh, on a political level, uh, a given country will try to strive for the best economic growth, but uh, uh, we should all play our parts. And I think universities play an important part in, um, in uh, stimulating uh, in a innovation by uh, gathering the right conditions for success. So uh, it's also part of uh, critical thinking. So uh, training by research, entrepreneurship, this new way, this new relationship with uh, uh, companies and that sort of sparkle that you can uh, actually generate in laboratories. There's uh, actually a, a report that's been, or a study that's been done by the EUA uh, on the approach to innovation in Europe, where it's very clear, uh, clearly explained how universities can create the, the, the right conditions that are conducive uh, for innovation without having the, 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 the mere role of creating unicorns. So uh, unicorns are these startups that raise funds beyond 1 billion, I think. Uh, Anna, Anna Gupulu, uh, how far should we go in supporting startups? Well, first of all, uh, the European Commission uh, gave a very clear response in the context of Horizon Europe program by putting uh, under its pillar three, 10 billion euros on innovation, supporting to SMEs, including support to, to startups. So it's in, in disruptive innovation. So it's very clear that this is the way to go ahead. It's, it's a backbone of our economy. It's a backbone of international economy, and we have to go ahead with that. Is that enough? Is that the funding and the instruments that we put in place in order to establish a, a, a strong innovation ecosystem in Europe where startups could be flourished and where venture capitals could be attracted and where we will be able to create the European unicorns as well? No. And it's not enough. And the gap analysis demonstrated that despite the fact that, that we have excellent research results and that uh, we are able also to develop uh, uh, new uh, patents, new technologies, we are not able to scale them up and we are not able to put them in the market. Uh, we have the example of, and I always, we always use that, this example, of a BioNTech vaccine, which is the Pfizer vaccine, has been created in uh, uh, EU labs and has been That's scaled right. up uh, by uh, an American company. So we need to do more. We need to do more at political level. And here I would like to address what we can do to, ask, to attract the more private investments to the instruments that we have already in place. We need to, to do more to alleviate the regulatory uh, um, bottlenecks that we have in Europe, which enable companies to scale up. We need to do more uh, in order to, to, to have uh, an, uh, an effective and not disruptive innovation ecosystem. The innovation ecosystem that uh, is created at local level needs to be also interconnected at European level so that we be able to give opportunities to companies, but to give opportunities also to universities to liaise with the business mm -hmm. and to promote the, the, the market that we need through new technologies and innovation. And we need to be able to attract talent in Europe. So researchers that they also have the opportunities to be entrepreneurs, and they also have the opportunity to work in these scale ups or to create the scale ups, huh? but also we have to provide them the environment that they will not lose uh, the through by by engaging the scale up uh, their career yeah. in the future. So we we need to look at all these five elements and do more if uh, if I hear you more. well and, and do, do more. more. 
And to okay, move. Um, in the audience, would you have some questions or comments to, to make? Um, you're very welcome to, to ask your questions or maybe add some comments to what they have already done about the scales, about because in a, in a moment, not yet, okay. Um, in a moment, I will ask uh, Thierry Coulomb, maybe you can, you can come joining us, Thierry Coulomb. Just give some point of view about what you are hearing now about this uh, situation. Okay, up to you. And I'll check if I have other questions on my tablet. Ça n'est pas complètement euh, évident okay. de, de résumer. Well, it's uh, not an easy thing to sum up uh, this very rich uh, debates and all the all the uh, all the subjects that have been uh, brought up. Uh, I, I, I'll try to uh, uh, structure it. I think there's a uh, a, a pretty simple idea, but that is nonetheless really determining, that, is, that underpins everything, is that contemporary challenges cannot be tackled without a real effort put into research and innovation. Uh, you know, uh, like Prometheus, uh, we know that we need to pass on um, uh, challenges, uh, change, sometimes the uh, uh, very powerful. Uh, we can't tackle all of that without a lot of uh, research and without transmission. The second idea is of a geopolitical nature. When we talk about Europe, it's sort of ambivalent uh, because Europe is a geopolitical uh, uh, center that needs to reassert itself uh, faced with the other uh, two major geopolitical centers. But at the same time, it's characterized by uh, its uh, being open uh, to uh, the rest of the world and a certain idea of the uh, uh, general interest and public interest, which is not exactly the same uh, in the other two major geopolitical uh, centers. The third idea, which is very specific to our field, is the good old discussion between uh, co collaboration and competition. To be honest, I think we all have a fairly clear idea of how to strike a balance between the two, but I'd like to say three things. Firstly, as a researcher, I've always experienced my work as a researcher as being uh, 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 intrinsically uh, collaborative, uh, you know, uh, really scratching my head and, and looking for solutions with colleagues, together with colleagues. And I uh, uh, but uh, uh, but maybe that's because I'm in a field, uh, in a specialized field where we don't uh, really need to fight for funding. But I think researchers in their daily lives, uh, the fact that it's very collaborative uh, is very ingrained, very much more ingrained than competition for funding or awards. Of course, you always strive for excellence. So you try to uh, push your limits to be the best. Uh, Second thing that we need to bear in mind, I think, uh, uh, talking about competition, is that there's a certain degree of uncertainty and risks. Of course, if competition is about ranking people on a predetermined scale, that won't lead us uh, uh, anywhere. Uh, we need to take risks and we sometimes get things wrong and we need to bet on a number of things. And including in the evaluation of projects, yes, well, that's not our work. Our work is very complicated, but it's a bit easier than this, which is to evaluate ex post, which is uh, complicated uh, enough. But even with ex post uh, uh, evaluation, you need to have a certain humility um, uh, because of the degree of uncertainty that is intrinsic uh, uh, in uh, science. Um, 
Uh, uh, but uh, about that uh, question, uh, will not small centers be at a disadvantage? Well, we've heard it so many times. When you reach a certain age like me, uh, that when you hear it again, uh, I, uh, it's, you know, it's natural to worry and it's a good thing because it uh, helps avoid mistakes. But have we looked 20 or 30 years back the concentration of funding in France? It was huge. And the new uh, tools call for projects, um, uh, in initiatives for excellence should enable uh, have they enabled to uh, a, uh, a, um, a higher concentration? Uh, uh, laboratories of excellence in France, if I look at France, uh, have actually ended up being located uh, in uh, places where the uh, traditional uh, way of funding could not have enabled. It's made it possible for certain fields, in particular in uh, humanities and social sciences, to get funding that they had never had before. It's made it possible for young researchers that were not in top teams to actually um, uh, out, uh, outstrip their mentors. So the you know uh striving for truth and ranking people uh, uh if it led to concentration well concentration um uh we've uh, had before so i think it's a bit more subtle than that and i'll try to conclude the fourth um point that was made in particular by Manuel, but not only, is the role of an institution that comes from the Middle Age, which is uh, a university, because it, uh, uh, it, it, it creates the connection between um, uh, training and research. Uh, and the fifth idea is the idea of diversity, diversity in goals and in the identity of uh, uh, institutions, but within an area where um, uh, circulation and, 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 and uh, uh, mobility is absolutely essential. So, but we can combine both. Um, uh, and lastly, um, What's the vanishing point of, uh, of, of all of this? First, one, you know, uh, two, uh, make progress and, uh, and, and make such a, a, an area uh, uh, attractive. Uh, you have to be clear on trying to identify uh, strengths and weaknesses. And the second uh, point of attention, which uh, 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 is important for us as citizens is the question of funding and resources, but both are connected. If you want to convince the political decision makers, the state and society to fund uh, higher education, research and innovation, you should uh, demonstrate that uh, we know how to evaluate ourselves. Well, maybe to wrap up whilst opening up the discussion, it's a comment uh, from uh, an uh, internet user. It's necessary to uh, facilitate real risk taking, including in research projects. I'll uh, leave that question open. Uh, how can we engineer that um, uh, in practical terms? We'll come back to it. Thank you very much.